what, what NASA is saying, because of the ridge that goes around it, decided that actually came together from two distinct parts. Which was the splitting of the moon. And we know their history, who were eyewitness, witnesses to the account. They saw the moon split. Now, oh, these are opponents of Islam. Yeah. They're, they're trying to crush Islam. And they're also reporting that they saw the splitting of the moon. People that don't know each other. People that wouldn't be able to make up some kind of a joke or conspiracy or lie. In the end, you'd have to say, you know what? It's all documented. It's all of these, all, all of these details are documented. Wow, this is amazing. For opponents who were not even in Mecca but were in the same geographical location in the Arabian Peninsula, they also confirm that yes, we saw the splitting of the moon. Muslims, we want to make sure we are talking about something you can verify, research, depend on. We want to be honest and academic. So, and the history of this king, who saw the splitting of the moon, and became a Muslim and built this mosque. They're more accurate, there's more of a science behind it than the reports that you have for, let's say, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, I, and some of the presidents. What I, would you say to that? I can say that without the shadow of a doubt. Wow, this is amazing. I mean, this should be on every uh, major uh, news reporting agency. This is the Dean, the Dean Was it with the Bloods or the Crips? A different time in life, huh? Yeah, different time, different world. Uh, it's uh, subhanAllah, it's what Allah wrote. You know? That's one of the miracles that also is just amazing to see people like yourself and many others who make that transition, going down one way of life, and then now we're here talking about a very important topic, purpose of life, why we're here, you know, in this world. Yeah. And now this is what you specialize in, amongst other things. And what we wanted to specifically talk about was the miracle of the Quran. Because we know that every messenger that God Almighty Allah sent, he came with miracles. Just to give an example, Jesus, Moses came with miracles that were re relevant for his time. But you can't bring those back today. Same thing with Jesus, peace be upon him. He had miracles that he did to prove that he was indeed a messenger of Allah, not a literal son of God or divine in any nature. And he did miracles at that time, but you can't bring those back today. But we have a living miracle, and you talked about one of the specific signs in there, which was the splitting of the moon. Mm -hmm. And then you went above and beyond, and you actually verifying them, you called the British Institute. Can you go ahead and... Uh, talk to us about the splitting of the moon, this specific miracle, and then what you actually did to confirm it. Excellent. So, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala khatim al-anbiya shirat al-mursaleen. We always want to start by praising uh, our Creator and talking about the, the, the essence of what we as Muslims first believe in. And we believe in this miracle because we know in Surah Al-Qamar, which is a, a chapter in the Quran, Allah tells us about that the time of the Day of Judgment is growing closer and the moon has split. When I was studying the Quran, when I saw this verse in the Quran, and I looked at the reports about this, this incident, I found that in our history books, in Islamic history books, we talk about this amazing incident, that the people, the people who were the people of Quraysh, the people who were polytheists, they asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for a miracle. And he asked them, if, you, if I show you a miracle, will you believe? They said yes. So he, he asked Allah, he, he didn't do it on his own, he asked the Creator, and the Creator, as a miraculous sign, split the moon in two, and it was a clear split where they could see it between the mountain, and then they came back together. So when I saw this, uh, I started to speak to some people at my work about it. Even though I'm, a, I'm an imam in a mosque here, I do the da'wah, I do that only for the sake of Allah, I don't take any money from that. I work a, as a regulatory and quality consultant at a medical device company. Most of the people I work with, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, uh, are scientists or engineers or PhDs, people who work on developing new devices, people who work on releasing new uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and so on. So a lot of them, yeah, they, they thought when I spoke to them about Islam, they always get surprised that somebody who's working in the medical device industry and, and works with this believes in such a thing. So I was telling one of my coworkers, a PhD, very intelligent man about this, this thing in the Quran and, and he told me this is impossible scientifically it's impossible there is no way something as large as the moon could 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 come apart and come back together or even two bodies like that could come back together and would be seamless today so you know me and him started having this conversation and 
one day he came back to me and he said, you know, I was at a presentation and, you know, again, he's a PhD researcher, very intelligent man. He said, I was at a, at, at a presentation from NASA and they were talking about one of the moons of Saturn. And this moon, and it's called Lepidus, is actually what, what NASA is saying because of the ridge that goes around it they thought it that actually came together from two distinct parts and today wow. it's together as one moon so i thought that was interesting and i started to research this from a purely scientific perspective that is it scientifically possible that two large bodies like a split moon could come back together and be one body again and i found multiple examples now uh, i want to be very explicit that these these are theories that NASA has put forward. You can look that up on their website. They have the pictures that I used in my video, and, and you or feel free to share them here, are all from NASA. They're not doctored, they're not Photoshop, they're not our images. These are NASA images. So NASA sent a rover out, the Cassini, to Saturn, and, and went and looked at the different moons, and one of the moons that really stuck out was Lepidus. And Lepidus has this strange ridge right across the whole moon, and they have other features that were different. The two sides of the moon were very different. So many theories came out. We don't have any picture evidence. We don't have any eyewitnesses. We don't have any video. We don't have a YouTube uh, clip on what happened originally. But the idea came out to be from NASA that millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years or however long ago, either the moon split and came back together or two moons crashed together but today, according to NASA, according to scientific research, this is one moon that was two parts at one time. So I thought that was interesting. And my non-Muslim atheist uh, co-worker found it very interesting because we had talked about this. And he said, you know what? You were right. It is possible. So we started to research this more. We found the same thing with Miranda, one of the, one of the moons of Uranus. So I thought that was interesting as well. But that's not our moon, right? So we got in this discussion said, well, that's true. It is possible, but not yeah. our moon, right? So me and him started researching together, and we found that our moon actually has two very distinct faces. The face that's facing the Earth and the face that's facing away from the Earth. And there are what's called remas. Remas, um, as you can share pictures, uh, they are they are cracks or lines that go all across the moon in different patterns. Some of them, like the, uh, they, like they are about 300 kilometers. Some are bigger. Some are smaller. And NASA and scientists have always been very curious as as what causes these. And there are many theories. You know, there there lava pits. There 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 tunnels that have come. There the 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 face of the moon is actually moving, and and and, and the moon is extracting, or, or so on. But all of those are theories. One of the theories that we found that NASA had put forward was that, that it is very possible that the moon had actually come together from two distinct parts. And there's a rendering that NASA created. And this is a painting because obviously we didn't have any actual pictures. They claim it to be about, you know, a billion something years ago. So they said, okay, two parts came together and made the moon as it is today. Oh, so that was interesting. That's our moon that we're talking about. So... I started to get into this conversation. I, I, I spoke to people who are scientists, people who are, who are working on, on rovers and things. And they said, you know what? How did the moon even even come to exist? They said, well, there was a, a, a another moon or a planet the, the size of Mars that crashed into the Earth and, and morphed off into making the moon as it is. So I said, well, where's the witnesses for that? Who saw this? Where's the video? Where's the evidence? Is there a big crater on the side of the Earth? They said, no, no. But they said, we look at the moon and we look at certain characteristics and we deduce from it. So I said, okay. So you have no actual eyewitness witness. You don't have any evidence, but we're deducing. Okay. So I told them, when we look at the moon and we look at these remas and we look at the two very distinct sides, how do we know how did the moon come back together? Or was it split or was it two different parts? They said, well, we don't know. So I said, okay, could it be possible then that the moon did split at one time and come back together like the other moons that we've seen? And they said, well, it is possible. Okay, but where's the evidence? And that's where we started to get into the research of the evidence. Islamically, I presented evidence which is from the Quran first off. Now, as a Muslim, we believe in the Quran. And that, that's for us. 
But as, as an atheist, as a non-Muslim, that, that was not convincing for them. Not a problem. I said, oh, okay, what type of evidence would you accept? We said, well, I mean, do we have any eyewitness evidence? Because right now, we do have cracks, we do have rimas, we do have all of these signs. But do we have any eyewitness evidence? Yes, we do. And that's where we go to the first aspect of the evidence that we look at. In Islam, we have a science called Mustala al-Hadith or Ilm al-Rijal, the checking of narrations. And it is very important for people to understand the science because we who work on clinical trials, we who work on scientific research, um, we have certain standards. If we can show something to have repeatability, we can show a lot of people to have seen the same thing, then we say, okay, this is acceptable. And then we research on why. So here, in the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him, we have reports. These are what we call hadith. And these are not fairy tale. These are people who are eyewitnesses that we can tell you who they were, who they reported it to, how was their moral character, what we call adal, how was their precision in reporting, which we call dhab. This is more than any other historic research that we find out there. So now we have going from a scientist that you are a colleague who now is saying, no, this is not possible, to having a shift of opinion, it's possible. And now NASA coming forward with showing some kind of what seems to be cracks in the Earth somehow coming together. What did you call them? What's the term you used? The that Rima. Rima. Oh, Rima, yeah. Rima is, so, is meaning a, a trench or a line, and these are all across the moon. They're different yeah. Rimas. Go ahead. So this would kind of just... Um, signify that now this could be what the Quran is talking about, like the, the split, right? right, coming together. So now you're going into the second phase, eyewitnesses. Exactly. So so the rimas and, and the signs that we see, the two distinct faces of the moon, show that there are two distinct bodies that did come together. But now, how did it happen? When did it happen? NASA doesn't have an answer for that. Right? They mm -hmm. have theories, but they have no answer because they have no witnesses. They have no video. They, they had no satellite but, image. They have none. But we as Muslims do, right? So we present our evidence of eyewitness accounts now, right? Okay, so now, because obviously there had to have people that seen it. If you see a moon splitting, you obviously, obviously you, I gotta have, I gotta there have people. Go. But but, but here's the thing. How, how do we know that, okay, this, this is, uh, are there also people who are not Muslims reporting this Excellent. at the same so, time? So, so let, let, let's get there, right? So let's get to the mm -hmm. eyewitnesses right now. So we have, first and foremost, um, Anas ibn Malik, he was a, a, a companion of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He reported this event. And before we talk about Muslims and non-Muslims, different want to understand that we have the biographies of all these people. We know exactly who they were. We know when they were raised. So Anas ibn Malik, he's from the people of Medina. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was in Mecca. So he's one of the people that reports this. Right? We also have Abdullah ibn Abbas, who was very young at the time, Abdullah ibn Umar. We also have uh, Jubair ibn Mut'im. Now, this is very important because Jubair ibn Mut'im, at the time that this event took place, he was not a Muslim. He was a non-Muslim. He became Muslim at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So he's one of the people that reported it. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud from the people of Mecca, he reports, he says, that the people of Mecca, they came to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they told him, if you're a prophet, show us a miracle. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in one of the narrations, he told him, what do you want? He said, split the moon for us. So he prayed, and these people who we can name and we know their history, who were eyewitness, witnesses to the account, they saw the moon split. And they saw it then come back together in the same night. Now again, that's, that's a miracle. Right? That's an amazing event. But who were the people that reported it? Well, we mentioned those that were from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar. These were the companions. These were people that we know. We know their biographies. We know that they all reported at the same time in Mecca. But there wasn't just in one city. There was Anas ibn Malik, as you mentioned, that was in Medina. But what's more interesting, in the book, Bidaya wa Nihaya, you will find uh, a narration. And I looked at the narration, and it's authentic. It's been checked. There was Walid ibn Mughayra, Abu Jahl ibn Hisham, As ibn Wa'il, Aisha ibn Hisham, Al Aswad, Al Aswad ibn Muttalib, uh, Al Zam'a, Al Nadar ibn Harith. These were polytheists. These were the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. These were. Go ahead. These are just like, okay, you mentioned a name, and now this is some person like, you know, because let's say you have other books 
that uh, let's just compare it, you know, for, for instance, like the, the, Bi the Bible. You have certain books, and this is not to disparage on anybody's faith or any, but this is what, you know, uh, uh, Bible scholars tell us, you know, that we have books in there that you cannot link to who the authors were. You know, you might have a name, but we don't know who these people are. Now, in contrast, how does that play out here? Do we actually, right. these people, detailed, you know, uh, life biography of these people? Perfect. Great question. So now, if we look at uh, the biblical books like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, these are written according to their account. They're actually not written by them. As we see in Peter, many of them, there were Aramaic-speaking uh, fishermen who were illiterate. These were in Koine Greek. They weren't written even in the language that they spoke. And we don't even know much about it, other than maybe the location that they were from. We don't know their last name. We don't know their father's name. We don't know their wives. We don't know their children. We don't even know what kind of precision they had in memory, any of that, right? Even if you leave religious text out of it. Let's talk about secular science or, or history that we depend upon. Uh, Eddie, for example, how did Hitler die? They don't really know, to be honest with you. They don't, because who, who reported what he did at the time of death? Who did they tell it to, right? Who was Alexander the Great? Who actually saw Alexander the Great that can we name? Like today, if you, I'll give you an easier example. We're in America, both of us, right? Now, mm -hmm. we know there to be a, a man named George Washington, right? Eddie, you believe that? I believe that, right? There was a man named George Washington. He gave the Eddie, Gettysburg Address, right? Who's, who heard it from him? Can we name anybody? I, I, I've gone to historians and I've told them, okay, give me the first-hand report. Give me who was the one standing there that heard it and who did they tell it to? Until it was written down in, in a book, in history, we just believe it because it's in a history book. But no, we're going to a whole different level of precision. We're saying, I'll give you, for example, I said Abdullah ibn Abbas. His name is Abdullah. His father's name is Abbas. He was the uncle of the Prophet He was from the tribe of Quraysh. We know his sons. We know his wife. We know where he lived. We know where he moved. We know how many hadith he memorized. The number exactly. We know this is all documented. All of these, all, all of these details are documented. Wow, this is amazing. And you see these books behind me. I have a whole section in my library that is just dedicated to the biographies of these people. We have entire volumes written on each one of them, up to the point that we even know what kind of food they like. We know what kind of business they were in. We know how long they lived, which cities they went to. All of this, not just this, we know how good they were at memorizing and reporting correctly. Now, if this was just one report, that would be amazing. But no, we have what we call mutawatir. And these are technical terms. I want to explain them to the audience, especially to the non-Muslim audience to understand the precision that goes into recording hadith. Right? This called mutawatir. What does that mean? It comes through numerous chains. It's not just one person who witnessed it. Right, so as I'm and I'm telling you this right now, Anas ibn Malik, Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Al Hudayfa, Ali ibn Abi Talib, all of these people that we have reports from regarding this incident, right? Not just Muslim, but non Muslims that were there in Mecca. Now, all of these different people who some of them that were in, like Anas ibn Malik in Medina, they saw this event at the same time. So it's not like one or two or three people now. If it was only those people that were Muslim, those people that were pro the message of Islam, then somebody could say, you know what, they're all making it up. Okay, but now we have Walid ibn Mughayra, an enemy of the Prophet ﷺ who fought the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. We have uh, Abu Jahl, the famous uh, Hisham ibn Am uh, Amr ibn Hisham. Right? We have uh, As ibn Wa'il. We have uh, As. Uh, 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 Ibn Nadar, we have, uh, I'm sorry, uh, As ibn Hisham, uh, Aswad, we have Aswad ibn Muttalib, Zam'a, Nadar ibn Harith. These were a group who were challenging the Prophet sallam, and they report that we saw this. We saw so these are, these are oppo now these are opponents of Islam. Yeah. They're, they're trying to crush Islam, and they're also reporting that they saw the splitting of the moon that's mentioned in the Quran. Yes. Not just that. Wow. When they saw this, they were amazed, but they were people who had a lot of hatred for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So they said, you know what? This was magic. He tricked us, right? Mm -hmm. So what they did, 
And these are historic reports in hadith books that I checked, and in my video, I present all the references for anybody who wants to recheck them. Now, what they did is they went out and they asked the other, the trade people, the people, caravans, the people who were polytheists, enemies of Prophet Sallallahu who were out of Mecca at that time. They said, you know what? If the Prophet Muhammad tricked us and they did, he did this magic on us, he can't do it on everybody. So we're going to ask those people that weren't in Mecca at the time. When their caravans came back and he said, hey, we saw this, this event. Did you guys see this? They confirmed those enemies, opponents who were not even in Mecca, but were in the same geographical location in the Arabian Peninsula. They also confirmed that, yes, we saw the spreading of the moon. So now you have extraordinary evidence. You have the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, many of them, numerous reports. And now what is very important is each one of them, they told different people and who told different people through all these different chains of narrations and is recorded across different historic record records, the books of Hadith. All of them report this. This takes it to what we call mutawatir, to such numerous chains that numeric, numerically it's impossible that this didn't happen. Give an example like, uh, like you know, Trump is walking his dog. You know, you gave this Excellent. example. Uh, go ahead and share that. So Excellent. you can really Excellent. hit home. So, so let's talk about that, right? Today, if somebody, uh, let's, say, let's give you two examples. One, like a very personal example. Eddie, for example, you got a neighbor that tells you, you know what? Uh, don't go down that street. The police has blocked it off. Right? Somebody tells one neighbor tells you that. Well, I mean, I don't know how well you know your neighbor, and I don't know how maybe he's maybe he's got you know some issues. Maybe he's just kind of making that up. Maybe he doesn't want you to go down that street. So you might be like, you know, that might be true. It might not be true. But if that neighbor tells you, and your other neighbor tells you, and some dude just coming down the street said, hey, you know what? The police has blocked it off. Now, when you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four. If you have so many different people that come and tell you, Eddie, the street's blocked off. People that don't know each other. People that wouldn't be able to make up some kind of a joke or conspiracy or lie. In the end, you'd have to say, you know what? The police probably blocked off that street because so many people are not going to come together and that don't know each other for no apparent reason and make up a lie. And if some of those neighbors hate each other, some are Trump supporters and some are Biden supporters, and they both come and tell you that that street's blocked off, you know what? The street's blocked off, right? This is how we checked references in the scientific industry when we look at a clinical trial if we repeat use of certain drug or a vaccine and we see an effect repeatedly we say you know what it the effect is from the drug so when you have different people from different tribes from different cities who have different motives some are enemies some are friends some are proponents some are opponents all come and report that we saw this then we say, you know what, this, this is a fact, this has to have happened, because all these pe different people from different backgrounds who didn't come together and discuss this issue, Anas ibn Malik, he reported this years later, he was in Medina, he wasn't even in Mecca at the time, years later. So, so, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, finish your talk. Jubair ibn Mut'im, one of the people who reported this, he, at that time, he was not a Muslim, he was, he was an enemy. Later, from, from this event and other things, at Hudaybiyah, he became a Muslim, and then he still reported. He said, you know, I remember at that time, even though I wasn't a Muslim, I remember seeing this. Now, I'll tell you, Eddie, the very, very, very important point, and this is where you really got to be amazed. This was in Mecca. This incident happened, and it was revealed in the Quran, as me and you both know in Surah Qamar. If somebody wants to look it up, Surah Qamar, in the first two ayat, right? You have this event. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, he migrated to Medina. And he was in Medina. And then he came back. This whole time, all these polytheists who were enemies of Islam, who were trying to make up all kinds of rumors against the Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, they heard this verse. They never challenged it. Think about this. If this hadn't happened, those people who were polytheists would have said, you know what, the Quran says the moon split, but we were in Mecca, we didn't see it. Very profound point right now. Very what you're important. saying is that very important. And a lot of times people skip over these, you know, just really uh, in your face uh, points and signs. But it's really nice how you uh, highlighted this. So they would have definitely challenged because it's obviously this is a bold statement. The hey, moon is split, imagine, but no, imagine, nobody challenged it. Imagine in our time if President Trump comes back and says, you know what? I sent a, 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 a space mission to Jupiter, right? Makes a, a, yeah. a claim like that, right? 
Biden's administration and everybody would jump on that. They would jump on that. What? You made this claim? Show us the, where, where's the video? Where, where's your evidence? Who, who are your witnesses? Bring NASA. Bring this. This never happened. They would challenge it. If wow. Biden made that claim, Trump would challenge it. Right? So you see, you have opponents. So if they can catch you in something like this, they will jump on it. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he split the moon. The Quran had it. The, the people who were the enemies of Islam would hear these verses all the time. Right? Mm -hmm. Me and you, when we pray in Ramadan, it's coming up. We, we hear the whole Quran, we hear these verses. Me and you, when we read the Quran, even even uh, an opponent of Islam today who goes and gets the Quran, he reads these verses. So imagine those people that were physically in battles against the Prophet, peace be upon him. They were in these propaganda battles. They heard these verses. They heard these claims from the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said it. They could have chatted. They said, you know what? We didn't see this. But all of them admitted Every report that we have, everything, those that we don't have reports, we don't know. But those that we have report in history, all of them admitted, yes, this incident took place. Mm -hmm. What if you go outside of this geographical Excellent. location? That's are, 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 there, are there people that now saw it outside of, you said Mecca, Medina, but how about uh, uh, out of the Arabian Peninsula? So this took me to my next uh, stage of research, right? So this was amazing for me from a scientific perspective and then from a historic perspective looking at this. But I, I got a lot of questions from my co-workers think that I would discuss this with that. Well, well, if something amazing like this had happened, what about people in other geographical locations? Did they see the moon of splitting of the moon? So I started to research this issue. Now, Eddie, you have to understand that we're looking at uh, more than 1400 years ago. So we didn't have cameras. We didn't have this kind of technology. What we had were people that would write down in their different historic work. So I started to research different history books from different regions of the world to see if something like this would report, was reported. We have things like uh, that are ambiguous, and I didn't want to depend on anything like this. I want to depend on what is verifiable, what's research, what's authentic, right? So I found that uh, the Mayans, for example, they had in their calendar a split moon, an image of a split moon coming together. But I can't depend on that because... That's not clearly stating that this happened at that time and in that place and how it happened. That's something ambiguous. We have the, the Chinese who have a, a mooncake that's split and used, but I don't depend on any of that. I, started I mean, those can be like, you can add those in, kind of, they're kind of weak, but it's still somewhat of, you know, uh, you, you really want to be academically sound. Exactly. You don't want things like that. People could just like exactly. Nostradamus type of, you know, uh, predictions. You, you, hit, you hit it on the head right there, right? So we don't want to, we don't, like, like we see a lot of Christians and Jews and things, sometimes they bring very ambiguous things in, and, and we, we don't want to be like that. As Muslims, we want to make sure we are talking about something you can verify, research, depend on. We want to be honest and academic. So I started to look in my research here in the works of Hadith first and foremost, right? looking at the different reports that were from Mecca, from Medina, from the tribes, from caravans, from enemies, from proponents. I researched this where it was 100% verifiable because I could find the names of the enemies even and the proponents and opponents and those that became Muslim, those that never became Muslim but still admitted that this miracle had taken place. So that was the crux of why I believed in it. But I wanted to see if there was any supporting evidences. Even looking at those types of evidences that were ambiguous, I didn't accept those. I started to first look at what would be the time frame and who would be able to see it, right? Because, for example, you're, I believe, in New York, right? Chicago. Chicago, close enough. I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm on the West Coast. I'm, I'm in San Diego, right? So our time zones are different. But if you look at somebody in England right now or in China right now, where there's night and day, we're not seeing the same things. So if somebody if somebody's looking at the moon in, in the early part of the night, well, there are going to be people that are not going to be able to see the moon because it's going to be daytime. It's going to be bright sun out. You know, and sometimes you can see the moon in the daytime, but regularly you cannot, right? That, that's just not possible. Some people are going to be fast asleep because it's going to be 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. or close to 5 a.m. or whatever, a part of the night that usually, especially at that time, people weren't out looking at the sky. So... I had to start looking at where would it be possible. So no doubt in the Arabian Peninsula around that geographical location, it would be possible. And we have reports from different cities and different places. We got that. If you look at the Americas and if you look at uh, Europe, most likely at this time of the night, it would be daytime here because as we see, the sun 
starts its cycles rising from the east and going towards the west. So when, it, when night has come to the Arabian Peninsula, because the moon was visible, it would have been daytime in the Americas. So most likely you will not see a report out of there. If you look at very far to the east, it's going to be the depth of the night. It's going to be almost, you know, getting close to the morning. So this is the time, especially at that time in an uh, agricultural society, everybody's going to be asleep. So the only areas that we saw that would be close to the Arabian Peninsula was going to be directly east. And that is the area today of uh, India and the subcontinent and the Central Asia area here. So I started to research, is there any report out of those areas that would support this clear evidence that we already have? And I found a reference of a book um, that was uh, written by one of the Muslim scholars in one of his books. I looked at that so that I started to research where the manuscript was and I found it to be in London. So I emailed the British Library and I got a report back. And, and in my uh, video, I read the whole email. I'll just read a part of what they wrote, which is from the Asian Africa Reference Services in the India office uh, in Asia Africa Study Inquiries. And uh, they have a subsection, which is the India Office Papers, Oriental Language Publication, Oriental Language Manuscripts. So I asked them, is there any such manuscript? So they confirm that there is a manuscript, reference IO Islamic 2807, and on portfolios 81 through 104, there is an account of an Indian king who was a Hindu king from Kerala, from the south of India, and he witnessed this. And then later when he went met Muslims, he uh, accepted Islam. Now, this was a, a book called Kissatul Shakarwati Firmad. Now, this is something that we cannot verify to the standard that we have in Hadith because we don't have first person, we don't know a lot of the history because the Indian history was not written down the same way. There was not that verification that we have in Hadith, but it does exist, right? So I thought, let me look into it. I'm not depending on it as an evidence because. Go ahead. And so now you're taking it to another level. Now you have yes. someone pretty much who can see daytime events, nighttime events, okay, in a different part of geographical location. And this was in India now? In India, in the southern part of India, yes. And this is a king from India. This his name was again? Uh, so we'll get to his name. This is, uh, okay. uh, the, the, this is the first step that I had in my research. So I said, okay, I found this. Now, I, as an academic, I, I, I didn't believe this was verified enough for me to depend on. And I, I'm already depending on the clear narration from the Hadith, but this is another source that I wanted to dig into. Now, I, I don't have carbon dating for this. We don't have verification in that way. So I emailed the National uh, Library of India. And this is a, uh, a, a segment that they have, which is the National Digital Library Project of India, where they have the National Library and they've digitized a lot of their manuscripts. Uh, and under their central library, and I found uh, out about them that they're even ISO certified. It's a very well set up uh, library, and it, and I I got to a Institute of Technology uh, part of it, and I emailed them and I asked them, "Do you have this manuscript?" So they wrote me uh, an email back, and they said, "We don't have this manuscript. This manuscript's actually in London. We have a digital copy." But they told me that there is actually an Israeli Orientalist, uh, Dr. Yo Yohanan uh, Friedman who translated it. So I thought that's interesting that people have even translated it. So I got the translation and I found some interesting things that mentioned this, but there were some things that didn't make sense. So I said, are there any other reports about this? So they told me there are new, and this is their words. This is not my words. So I'm quoting from their email. They said there are numerous oral and written traditions that state that Cheraman Purumal, the Chera King called Shanaka Varman, who had the title, Chairman Pramal is a title that their kings would have, who ruled from 621 to 640. Now again, it's very important because this is a, a Hindu from India, this is not a Muslim, who is telling us that according to their standards, not our standards, their standards, this is a oral and written tradition that they have accepted. And the time frame that they put him in matches exactly where the, the life of the Prophet ﷺ in the later part here. So he said, who ruled from 621 to 640, witnessed the splitting of the moon, and when he met Muslim traders, converted to Islam in 627 AD. Now, now this is coming from the National Library of India. And he gave me additional references. Now, this is very important. There is a book called Tariq Zuhurul Islam fi Malabar. This is about the Sa and he said this is the earliest manuscript on the genesis of Islam in Kerala 
house in the digital library and he gave me the reference number and Tuhfut al-Mujahideen, another book that is confirmed by Dr. Uh, Herman. Now, these two works that we just mentioned were written by Muslims, but there was a confirmation by, and according to them, uh, Dr. Herman uh, Gundrup, a German Christian missionary scholar and linguist of this manuscript. There is a Portuguese writer, Dorte Barbosa. He writes about this mighty king as well, who ruled in Kerala, converted to Islam and ordered the building of the Cherman Mosque. And this is very important, Eddie. Make sure we get back to this mosque uh, in a minute. Uh, and he ordered this building in 629 AD. Another Portuguese writer, these are all non-Muslim historians, named Jose Barbaros, and a, and a supporting separate Portuguese author named Diego Carcorcas, because the Portuguese had ruled Goa and this part of India. They had looked at a lot of these manuscripts. They also confirmed through oral and written tradition that it was well-known history that an Indian king had in fact seen the splitting of the moon and had in fact converted to Islam from this miracle when he had met Muslims. And as a historic evidence, this mosque still stands. Now this is the end. I'm just giving you some highlights. In my, in my video, I actually read the entire email. But these are very important aspects to understand. We as Muslims don't depend on any of these reports because we cannot verify them to our standards. And there are some discrepancies between these reports, but according to the Indian National Institute of Library here, their project, there are multiple reports, not one, multiple history books that ha they have manuscripts of that were verified by Christian missionaries in different Western academics that came and said, no doubt in Southern India, in which is Kerala today, in that area, there are oral and written traditions who mentioned an Indian king who saw the splitting of the moon and converted to Islam from seeing the splitting of the moon. And he ordered a mosque to be built. What's very interesting, Eddie, is that mosque is still standing. Till today, we have it. It's been renovated, obviously, but it's still standing. And if you... India, is it, is it, it in again? It's in southern India, in Kerala. Melamar, Kerala, the southern India part. Now, what I found to be amazing, you know, because... None of this can be verified to our standard. We don't have carbon. We don't have uh, reports of who witnessed and things. But this is Indian history. And in that time frame, 1400 years ago, this is the way Indian history is recorded through oral and such later written traditions. But this is so well accepted. I contacted a good friend of mine. He's a PhD. He's a professor. And, you know, he is from southern India. And he said, you know, when we were kids, we were taught this in school. This is well known to us. This is accepted history. In fact, he pointed me something very interesting. The Prime Minister of India, Modi, who, as many people know, is, is, is very um, nationalistic, uh, hardcore right, Hindu nationalist, RSS, BJP, anti-Muslim party. So he's not somebody who, who's going to be easy on Muslims or Muslim history. There's somebody who's very nationalistic and Hindu. Even he tweeted about this about this splitting of the moon and about and he had a golden replica of this mosque built repeat that the prime minister of india yes is sent is doing what again he's no, again, actually th this his this hit this history now he's actually because it's part of their history exactly now, now now when we see the prime minister of india it's also very important to understand he is from the bjp party meaning this is the anti-muslim party he is the one that enacted laws to try to uh, you know take Kashmir and, and, and have hardship on the Muslims there and, and all kinds of things where, so politically, he is very much against Muslims, right? But even him, he admits to this history and he had a golden replica made of this mosque that was built by this king. And he, had, he gave that as a gift to the king of Saudi Arabia to try to promote trade relations. And he and he tweeted, and I've given pictures of those tweets, and you can look it up. You can, if you look up. You have all these pictures. Where could people go to see all this? What you're talking so about? We have uh, what's called the One Message Foundation, which is a DAO organization here, and on the YouTube channel, if you put in YouTube One Message Foundation, the channel will come up. If you look at the videos, I have a video on this, and in it, I give all of the pictures. I give the pictures of the moon, the phases of the moon, the satellite images from NASA the historic pictures from the books of history that we verified as Muslims in the Hadith books from the, from the proponents and opponents. And also, I read the emails exactly. I, I, I'm not verifying these reports, these books, because I'm not there in those libraries, but this is from them. 
that their verification, I read them, and I show a picture of the actual mosque that is still standing. I, we show a picture of what it looked like and a picture of the golden replica that was made by the Prime Minister of India, the BJP Prime Minister of India, to give as a gift. And I have pictures of the tweets that he sent out talking about this mosque and the history of, of Muslim interactions and the history of this king who saw the splitting of the moon and became a Muslim and built this mosque. And he, the Prime Minister of India today, accepts this as their history and use this as a part of their trade negotiation with Saudi Arabia. So now that's a very important thing to understand, that we in the West may not realize this, but the people of India, especially in southern India, they know this. They have oral traditions, they have written traditions, they have accepted it according to their standards of history. The Prime Minister of India, who even though with his animosity towards Islam, even he accepts it and tweets about it. So this is something amazing. So what have the opponents of Islam, because even if you leave a little bit of room, you know, for uh, for them to attack, they will. So what do they say? What's the counter to this? And so we have we have counters that we get all the time. So we get counters like, for example, some of these historic reports, they say, well, you know, there, there are certain contradictions in them, certain uh, date ranges that don't make certain events that they report that some of them mentioned, for example, him going to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, accepting Islam at the hand of the Prophet Muhammad, some of them, uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. some of them saying that he became Muslim later with Malik ibn Dinar, some of them. And that is all true. We totally agree because these are according to their oral and written traditions. They don't meet the standards that we have. Right. But if you look at the Chera kings and these were uh, the, southern, the kings who ruled southern India, all of their accepted history today, 100 percent of their accepted history today from that time period and before is recorded in the same way. And this is very important because I started to research other events that happened, nothing to do with Islam in southern India at that time. Well, they're the same way. They have oral reports. They have written reports later by the Portuguese, by the Dutch, by Muslims, by others. And those reports also have certain contradictions, but that's how they record their history. Now, us as Muslims, we have a different level of verification. For example, there is a narration in a book that I have here in, in the Musadrak of Al-Hakim, where it mentions this Indian king in an Islamic history book, sending gifts to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But I didn't use that report. Why? Because there was a slight weakness in the chain. And some of the reports, they said that this was actually the king of Rome. So when I find anything minor even like that, I leave it aside. There is a report in, 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 in Al-Isab of Ibn Hajar about a, a king of India becoming Muslim. But I didn't accept those because there was weakness in the chains. We as Muslims stick to only what is authentically verified and acceptable. So this is very important. And they, 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 even our opponents have no response to this. I have challenged people. I go out every Sunday uh, to the park here. We give da'wah. As you can see the videos, we call people to Islam. We challenge. We have people come. We mention this. They cannot challenge the Islamic reports, the ones that we are depending upon. Now, these other reports that are from India, there are inconsistencies in them. Yes, that is true because that is how their history is. Somebody gave a report, somebody gave a date range. But if you look at the, the different reports in the different books, oral and written, no doubt it is a part of their history, right? So the opponents have no answer for that. They're more accurate. There's more of a science behind it than the reports that you have for, let's say, Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, I, and some of the presidents. What I, would you say to that? I can say that without the shadow of a doubt, without any hesitation, as somebody who has studied how history is preserved in the Western world and how the science. My master's degree, I have two masters. One is an executive MBA. But my second master's is in this science of hadith, this science about reporting about the last prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, let me ask you this. We have uh, Abraham Lincoln, for example. You brought up an excellent example. We know that he was shot uh, you know, in a theater. Okay. Other than the one who shot him, who didn't report it, who witnessed it? Well, we can say maybe his wife witnessed it. We, maybe other people there. Okay. Who did they tell it to? They didn't go and write a book about it themselves. Who did they tell this report to? And how good was their memory? How good was their precision? What kind of moral character did they have? Who, who were there? When we look at other people around, 
not just the people that were involved, but the people who reported this historical incident, we start to lose credibility because we don't know. George Washington, many historic events that we talk about, some of the greatest speeches that we record from certain historic figures in history classes in my university, in, in, the, in, the way, in San Diego I'm talking about, they were challenged. And many of them really didn't have eyewitness accounts. They were, they were written off writings of people much later on. Unlike the Islamic verification, when we talk about a hadith, an incident that happened in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we can tell you who the eyewitnesses were. We will tell you how many there were. We will tell you their history. We will tell you who did they report it to. Not just, okay, the, the, the people who saw it and then a history book written a thousand years later. No. The Islamic history, the science of hadith is so precise. And sometimes we have 70 different people who told 70 different people, who told 70 different people, who was documented in different areas, different lands, different tribes, some in Baghdad, some in Kufa, some in, in, in Dibash. So all of this, when it comes sometimes exact same wording, there is no doubt to this. You cannot, scientifically, it's verifiable. Wow, this is amazing. I mean, this should be on every uh, major uh, news reporting agency. I mean, people should um, really take this to the next level and make a documentary, actually, of this. And what are what are the and this is what we put out there for, you know, you, you know, people who are just uh, looking for truth, you know, to compile all this evidence. I don't think there's ever been like a, a major documentary on something like this. Have you seen anything? I have not. And I think me and you should work on a project. I'm ready if you're ready. This is, yeah, we should get some filmmakers, you know, people who really, yeah. uh, we get contacted all the time, you know, people who want to contribute. I mean, this is a great way. We can put them in touch with you. So if you're out there listening to this, I'm, this is amazing. Can you imagine? Yeah. Tell me this, when you're going through this and verifying this, you know, how did the, does this, for yourself personally, is this an Iman booster? Of course. You know, my, my Iman, first and foremost, when I read it in the Quran, I already believed in it because I know about the other miracles of the Quran. I know about the scientific miracles, linguistic miracles. For me, as a Muslim, this was something that I believed in as it was. But when I started reading the hadith, and not just one hadith, but looking at how many a hadith there were, looking at the fact that Ibn Hajjah also in his tafsir, he said this is mutawatir. It showed to me that this is through numerous chains. And, and it, it built a, a love that I had for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But it grew that love because I imagined, you know, that Allah gave him such an honor. And then I started to think about, you know, the, the, the other reports that came out of different parts of the world. And I started to discuss this with my co-workers. I tried to give them da'wah with this, right? Even my atheist co-worker said, you know what? This is the most amazing thing that I have ever heard about Islam. He says, you know, he, I've heard about Islam many things. And, I, you know, he, he made a really good point. And I'm going to make this point here, Eddie. As Muslims, we believe in the Prophet Moses and Prophet Jesus because of Islam. But if you want to look at it from his perspective as an atheist, my co-worker is an atheist. He said, you have given me more evidence about the splitting of the moon and this miracle of the Prophet that I cannot deny than any Christian has given me about any miracle of the, of the Prophet Jesus, or any Jew has given me about any miracle of the Prophet Moses. Now that's very interesting, right? From an atheist perspective, I'm not, for me as a Muslim, I have my own belief, but from his perspective, he said that Jews tell us, and Christians tell us, and Muslims tell us that, that Moses split the ocean. Well, where's the evidence for that? Other than biblical reports, which again, you know, if you look at the Old Testament, Jewish writings, you look at the, the Torah, it is not first-hand reports anymore because of the loss of the actual manuscript and the rewritings that were done. The New Testament, for example, again, not first-hand reports. So where are the first-hand historic reports? Is there any sign of it today that we can find? No, right? It is just belief. If you talk about miracles of Jesus, these reports, if you look in the New Testament, are all written by not first-hand witnesses. These are written 70 years, 100 years, 40 years after the time of Jesus, in a language that Jesus didn't speak, they've been, they've been, they say the, the gospel according to Matthew, but not written by Matthew, right? According to Mark, not written by Mark. Any Dr. Bart Ehrman or any researcher will tell you that these were not written by actual apostles. So, so now I think about this. Many Christians will take these on blind faith, but we as Muslims can give you evidence. We can give you eyewitness reports. Even that atheist asked me for a Quran after that. He asked me for a Quran. 
And I want our viewers who are not Muslims that are viewing this. I have I have one request after listening to all this. Go go get a Quran. Just get a Quran. Get a book of the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and, and just learn about it. Learn about these things. Ask us questions. Email Eddie. Ask or send a message. Ask. At least you owe it to yourself to learn about this. We got about five minutes left. I wanted to ask you a couple more questions. What does this entail? So this king who was from a Hindu background, is that correct? Yes. So then he went and accepted Islam. People are listening to this and they're like, wow, this is amazing. If this truly is, now they go research and they say like, wow, this is, you know, this is the, this is, this is a sound, you know, this is a, a deed, a miracle, along with all the other miracles. I mean, the Quran is a living miracle. Anyone who puts it to the test, I mean, they can see that this is not something that it could come from Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. He was just the last and final messenger. And then the simple message that's in the, the Quran. Can you talk about that? What did this king accept? You say this word Islam and all those others now over close to 2 billion people who are practicing it today. Alhamdulillah. Islam is not a religion that started with any one man. Unlike you look at Christianity named after Christ, Judaism after Judah, Buddhism after Buddha, Shintoism after, you know, all these religions that started by a certain idea or a person at a time. Islam is that true religion that that one creator sent to all the prophets. Aslama means when you submit your will to your creator. So from Adam and Moses and Abraham and Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, we love all of them. These are all the prophets of that one God. And those, all of those prophets, when they submitted themselves to their creator, they were Muslim. That is what Islam is. Islam is not the religion that started after the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Islam is the same religion that Abraham and Moses and Jesus taught. And they were Muslims by definition of the word. And that's why we have a sign in our da'wah booth that says Jesus is a Muslim. We love Jesus, we love Moses, we love Abraham, we love Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. You will never see a Muslim disrespect any of them. You will never see us making cartoons or, or, or any kind of uh, disrespect to any of them. Why? Because those are our prophets as well. We love them. There's only one message that one creator sent, and that is the message of Islam. If you look at the first commandment, the second commandment, this is the message of Islam, that there is only one creator, there's only one Lord, one Allah, one God, only one. And he is the only one that should be worshipped. Idols should not be worshipped. That is what this Hindu king accepted, is to deny the worship of monkeys and rats and idols and things like this, and to worship that own one creator that created me, that created you, that sent all these prophets, that gave us life, that gave us, that created this world and the universes and whatever else is out there, the creator of all of that, to worship that one creator, this is the message of Islam. Every one of us will live during the time of a prophet. If me and you, Eddie, lived during the time of Jesus, we would be from his followers and we would be Muslim. That's what a Muslim would be. We would believe in that one God and we would follow Jesus. If we lived in the time of the prophet Moses, we would be Muslim by following Moses. We would believe in that one God and we would follow the prophet Moses, peace be upon him. And me and you today, as we know, we live in the time of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He is the last of those prophets. So for, for us, it is to believe in that one God and to follow the prophet of that time, which is the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and him being the last prophet, he is the prophet till the day of judgment. This is Islam. What do you like to tell people? Because you were in a different zone at one point in your life. And there was one thing, it really was touching how... And it was scary at the same time, but touching how you actually saw that as a sign and then you just went in another direction. You started to think more. But you, what I want to say is you were in a certain zone, that zone like most people are, material things, cars, you know, uh, for men, women, women, uh, you know, doing, you know, uh, the things that they do, men doing the things that they do, the wants and needs, the desires, pretty much just following, you know, the desires. But then you had a, a, an experience. Uh, you were supposed to be at a phone booth at one time. And then someone else ended up at that phone booth and that person ended up getting killed. Is that correct? That puts you in a different zone. So my point, my question is, how do we, what do you like to tell people to get them from the zone of just materialism, of following the lusts and desires to this zone of talking? Because now times, you know how it is. You start to talk about Quran, Bible, you know, prophets. They're like, excuse me, what? What are you saying? It's like you're talking a different language. Eddie, what's life about? Why do we live? What's our goal? When I was growing up, I grew up in, in, in what we call the barrio, which you would call the hood. Right? We, we were in, in bad neighborhoods. And we looked up to drug dealers. We looked up to gang members. I, I didn't grow up with Muslims. I didn't grow up 
in, 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 a, in a pious household and this kinds of things. Uh, even though ethnically, yes, I was from Pashtun, from Pakistan, but, but I grew up in San Diego and I had no Muslim friends. All my friends, you know, the most of them were Mexican. Many of them were black or white or whatever, but none of them were Arabs or anything like this. So when I grew up, we looked up to guys that had money, that had cars, that had girls, that had that, that, those material things. And that's what we worked for. We, we joined gangs and did all this thing. I, I got involved in the gang world when I was around 10 years of age, around 12, 14. I was a bona fide gang member. And growing up, when we, when we had money, when we started to deal with drugs and things like this, when we got big, we started to live it up. What we thought was the life. We got lowriders, we got impalas, we got, we got, we had girls like more than you could handle. We had money in our pocket. We'd be throwing around, you know, you know, we started to get a taste, even though we didn't own houses or buildings or anything, because that's not how we thought. Right. But, but when that lifestyle came, you know, it came with a price and, and my, you know, what I at that time considered a very close friend, you know, somebody who I grew up with, somebody that, you know, he was two years older than me, but we, we were like brothers, like, you know, he was Mexican, but I, I used to be able to, you know, we used to have a, a place where the gang members would hang out and then you'd have his house. Nobody was allowed to go in the house. So have very strict family rules. Right. But I was one of the people that would go into his house. His mother knew me. Uh, you know, they they would speak Spanish to me. They would tell me they would think I was Mexican and I would tell them I'm, I'm not Mexican. They would be like, come on, man, don't be ashamed of being Mexican. <laughs> I'd be like, no, I'm from Pakistan, man. I'm Pashtun. And then they'd be like, don't worry about it, man. You're Mexican for us. <laughs> so I was very close to him. So at the time, you know, uh, a girl called me and you know, I was supposed to go meet with her and things. And, and there was a setup and, and I got busy with somebody else. And he was like, hey, you know, I'm going to go ahead and take that. I'm like, yeah, go for it. And he went there and, and he got killed. And I was at his funeral. And it was supposed to be me, you know, the setup was for me, but, but he got killed. But, but the, when I was at the funeral, I saw them, you know, he had a pole, you know, 357 nines and he had and all kinds of, but they would patch you up, right? I mean, they would patch you up for a funeral. And I looked at him, I looked at his body and I realized, you know, he, he was, he was only 20 years of age at the time. You know? I was around 17, 18, he was 20. Right. And he didn't look at peace. He, he, he was a lifeless body. Then I looked at at the car. You know, we, we, we had pitched in together at that time. And, and but he, he was older. He used to keep. We had a 64 Impala. It was nice. Lowrider hydraulics. And somebody else was driving his car. His brother was driving his car. He had 13 girlfriends, that, that guy, you know, at that time. And many of them they had kids from. <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're up in the gang world, you know, you get a lot of those perks, they would say, right? All of those girls, I saw them crying on somebody else's shoulder. And I saw them at the funeral crying with some other guy. Some other guy was already sweeping in there, right? I went to his house that day. His brothers were already fighting over his things. That Ben Davis jacket, this, this is mine. I'm going to take this, right? The same day. All the, all the money he had made from drug dealing or whatever else, somebody else had in their pocket. And it made me realize that everything we thought to be success, cars, money, girls, wealth, whatever, respect, all of that was gone. You were going to go into a grave by yourself, just you and whatever deeds, whatever belief, whatever you did for God or didn't, that's all that's going to go. So I realized that, that you can't make money and fame and just chasing girls or, 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 or these kinds of things the purpose of your life. You have to realize there's a higher purpose. And you have to wake up and you have to research and you have to read. If you're, if you're a Muslim, you need to wake up and go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. If you're not Muslim, you need to research. You need to find out what's the purpose of your life. And wake up because you don't know. My friend that's dead, he didn't know he was going to die that day. He was 20 years old. So you don't know how long you have. It's time to wake up and realize that there's a greater purpose we need to focus on. And we'll end with that advice. There's a greater purpose that we need to focus on. Thank you so much for sharing that story. We're going to have to get you back to get more details My of pleasure. your journey to Islam. Anytime. Inshallah. But you left people to really, you know, something fascinating uh, to really look into this miracle of the Quran. And then from there, indeed, we know it is a book sent down for the guidance of all mankind. What are you going to do with that now? It's up to you. Thank you so much for Thank sharing you. that with us. Jazakallah. May God Almighty Allah protect you. Jazakallah. 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 Jazakall